first of all, I'm so glad to be here with all of you who are considering the call of the deacon uh, or curious about the future of the United Methodist Church and uh, uh, the call of the deacon alongside of that. So it's a privilege to be here with you in that experience. We at Garrett are people who are committed to the call of the deacon. We are often called the school of the deacons and we'll talk more about that later. But uh, part of that is in relationship to the programs that we offer. So at Garrett, you'll find that most of the programs here, um, whether or not they meet the call, uh, meet the requirements for ordination as a deacon, um, we have decided that we wanna support you in that. And uh, if the program that you have applied to and are admitted to doesn't meet all of your ordination requirements, we wanna help you meet those ordination requirements by extending your scholarship to meet those ordination requirements. So um, hear that, we want you to apply to the program that's gonna be right for you. Uh, we want you to uh, get the education that's gonna support you in the ordained ministry that you are called to or the lay ministry that you're called to if it ends up being that ordination is not uh, your thing. So uh, we have multiple programs here at Garrett. There uh, are, of course, there's our flagship program, as we often refer to it, the Master of Divinity program, which meets all of your ordination requirements. Uh, and we have several MA programs. Uh, the MA in Public Ministry. I've had many deacons talk to me and say, "This is this is it. This is the thing we are called to as deacons." Uh, we have the Master of Arts in Faith, Culture, and Educational Leadership. Um, we just experienced a name change on that program. Uh, which is a wonderful program for people who are interested in, uh, well, I'll let Dr. Lee talk about that. <laughs> it's her baby. Uh, we also have the Master of Arts in Pastoral Care and Counseling, uh, a clinical track and a non-clinical track, which can support uh, people in the ministry of the deacon. Uh, and then also our uh, Master of Theological Studies, uh, has been used by some students uh, as their theological education for uh, becoming a deacon. Beyond our degree programs, we have what's called the Basic Graduate Theological Studies Program, BGTS, and that can be done alongside a master's degree to meet your ordination requirements for uh, the call of the deacon. And then uh, if you're over the age of 35, you can do it alongside a certificate program of which we offer several. Uh, so there are many, many on-wraps uh, to deacon ministry here at Garrett, uh, and we want to support you however we best can. Uh, when you're applying to Garrett, we want to talk through those things with you, so be sure to be in conversation with us. We have uh, a fabulous deacon on staff in our admissions office, Mr. Uh, Grant Showalt. Reverend Grant Showalter Swanson, sorry, uh, who can uh, help you figure out what educational requirements you might need and what program might be best to apply to. When you're applying, uh, the application process is essentially the same for all students. So you fill out the online application. You need to submit three references alongside that, a pastoral reference, an academic reference, and another reference. Uh, of your choosing, somebody who uh, understands your ministry and uh, or you as a person. If you're applying to the MTS program, please know that that other reference needs to be an additional academic reference. Uh, you're required to submit all of your transcripts from your uh, institutions that you've attended for credit, and you're required to complete a statement of purpose and submit a resume, including your, educa your educational and uh, leadership experiences, uh, vocational experiences. So we can get to know a little bit better your call and how you've lived into that so far. The application process is you submit all those things. So when we receive those items, we let you know that we've received them. And once it's complete, it usually takes somewhere between two and four weeks for us to respond to you you'll get an admission letter that says, congratulations, you've been accepted, hopefully. Uh, and with that information about your scholarship and next steps, okay? All students here are guaranteed a scholarship between, usually between 50 and 100% of tuition. So uh, you're in good shape when it comes to that. We wanna support your ministry. We know that uh, ministry is not a, um, financially lucrative career, shall I say. And so uh, our scholarships are one way that we can support you 
in uh, moving forward in that, in the way that you feel called to, not in the way that you need to, to um, get by. So I think that's all I need to share in this space, but please know that I'm always available for questions. I can put my email in the chat um, and I've got a phone number too, and I'm always happy to talk on uh, Zoom or Teams or whatever mode you are most excited about. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Katie. Um, I am just at this point gonna actually turn it over. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, Reverend Grant is our recruitment coordinator here um, at Garrett. And so I would say probably he's one of the top folks if you've been applying at all or anywhere in the process, probably not one of the top people that you've been in conversation with. Um, but he is also a deacon in the Northern Illinois Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. He is in, on the administrative side of education. He serves in church, local church ministry. He's a scholar. He wears a lot of hats, but, um, but he is someone that you will value getting to hear from. And so we're actually going to invite him to facilitate our conversation initially uh, with Dr. Reverend Dr. Virginia Lee, uh, who is the Associate Professor of Christian Education at Garrett, the Director of our Master of Arts in Faith, Culture, and Educational Leadership Program, as well as the Director of Deacon Studies. So at this point, Grant, I'll turn it over to you. And again, just keep in mind that we'll have time for questions at the end. Thanks so much, Scott. It's so exciting to be here with all of you. So many of you have had the privilege of talking with. Um, and this is especially uh, important to me as a deacon uh, because my time at Garrett was so foundational for me understanding uh, my call into the ministry of deacon. I, um, I didn't know about it before I came to seminary and it was because of people and mentors like Dr. Lee uh, that I was able to, uh, to understand that call and further follow God's call in my life. But uh, so Dr. Lee, I'd love to know uh, by way of introduction, could you talk a bit about your own call to the order of deacon and how have you lived into that call throughout your journey? Okay. I did remember to turn my microphone on. That's the first good thing. Um, welcome. It's good to um, be here with all of you. It's, um, I've been on sabbatical this semester, so I've not been in the classroom. So it's really good to be with all of you today. Um, I'll tell more about it um, later on, but this year in June, when I go to annual conference in Virginia, I'm a member of the Virginia Annual Conference, this will be the 25th anniversary of my ordination. I was one in the group of the um, first deacons that were ordained after the order was started in 1996, then the first um, deacons were ordained in 97. But, um, and so before that, I went to seminary in the early 90s, and I have to tell you, um, there were, at the time, I understood a call to ministry as having two things. Um, one is that a call to ministry had a mountaintop Damascus Road burning bush experience, and that it involved um, a call to preach, and I didn't have either one of those. So I never used the language that I had a call to ministry. Um, I, I kind of would use the language of um, God is leading me along a path. Um, now I look at it as it was a nudge I felt from God, which I later learned is part of the call to ministry. But I had grown up in a setting, a rural area in um, Virginia, where there was this singular understanding of um, what a call to ministry was. So uh, there was one um, diaconal minister at the time in the district, and I talked with her. I was one of those strange folks who grew up in a family, um, very United Methodist for generations. And so if we had a question about the church, we looked, went to the discipline. So I went to the discipline and read the chapter on diaconal ministry. And it was like it had my name written on every other sentence. So... Um, with that nudge, I started looking at seminaries, and um, because I was in Virginia, um, I went to Duke, and I had, um, I had resisted when I um, went to college to study before this. Um, this was back in the day when women in rural areas who had a, a gift for teaching, which I did, um, it was understood you'd be a public school teacher. And I resisted that idea of being told what I should do. 
So in college, I was a sociology major and thought I wanted to do social work because it was always something in a, a helping field. So when I got to seminary, at the time uh, when diaconal ministry was the, the order of the diaconate, I kept hearing things like, um, well, when you get a real call to, to ministry, are you going to be a real preacher? And I look back at that as being a really um, important and formative question that was asked to me, because I spent my first year of seminary really looking at what diaconal ministry and what the diaconate was. And what's really interesting is I learned the history of Garrett at the time, because I'll talk more about that in a minute, but Chicago Training School was an important part of that history of the diaconate. So those questions, and it's, it's so it's sometimes now, I encourage folks that if you're getting some pushback about being a deacon, don't necessarily consider that a bad thing. It's an opportunity to investigate. So um, I went to seminary to become a director of Christian education. That's what I understood my call at the time. And I've often said, um, if I'd known where I was going to be today, back 25 years ago, I'm not sure I would have ever taken the first step, not because I don't love where I am today, but I didn't believe there have been many steps in between. And I don't think that I would have ever believed that my journey would have gone the way it's gone. So again, being open to where God is nudging and calling you that your first call doesn't mean that's what you're going to be doing 30 years from now. So I'll just, I'll bring it back with, um, I feel like I've come full circle because I um, served churches in Richmond for seven years. I was um, on theological faculty at Memphis Theological Seminary in Memphis for 12 years. I've been here for 11 years. And what I'm doing now, and I'll talk some more about this later too, but doing a lot with child advocacy when with the Children's Defense Fund. And I feel like all of the, oh, and I was a public school teacher before I served the churches in Richmond. So all of these things I've done, I feel like now are being woven into a tapestry of what my current um, call as a deacon is. So I'll stop there, Grant. I can, I can go on and I'll, I can add other things and other questions. I love it. And thank you so much for sharing. And I'm, it's always such a blessing to get to talk to other deacons and hear their different stories and the different language and the, and the different pathways. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. And I think mm -hmm. you started to, to mention this, uh, Garrett, the history of Garrett um, and what's that, what that has led to today. Cause Garrett kind of refers to itself as the school for deacons. Um, so you, you, you started to touch on that, but I, I'd love to know, why is that? How has Garrett been invested in the ministry of deacons since the order's inception and even before? Well, that's, um, when I, I came to Garrett, um, left Memphis to come here because the position involved director of deacon studies. And, um, but this was a, um, coming to, to Chicago was a big change for me. But I said, from the day I set foot on the Garrett campus, I knew I was in the right place. It felt like home. And I think part of that feeling like home is that um, the history I learned, part of it involved the Chicago Training School, which was started in 1885. And it's not a direct connect with deacons, but it, it has a history. Um, it's a long story and I won't go into all of it, but back in the 1850s, 1880s, um, women were pushing for ordination in the, you know, in the Methodist church at the time. And um, again, this is a gross uh, oversimplification, but basically one of the ways that women were kept from being ordained was the creation of the order of deaconess. And the Chicago Training School was created to train those women who were going into social work, um, nursing, but doing it on behalf of the church. 
And so then to skip ahead in 1934, the Chicago Training School merged or joined with Garrett Biblical Institute. And what was important then is that in 1934, women were not a part of the Garrett um, uh, student body, or there were not very many of them. But with the, the two joining together, now Garrett was um, training persons who were interested in working for um, better social conditions, and there were a significant number of women who became a part of the faculty. So there's that kind of history in the background. Now, the actual order of deacons, when it started in 1976, um, Garrett created this um, deacon studies program in 1999. So almost from the beginning, and um, Dr. Margaret Ann Crane was the first director of the um, deacon studies program. You may or may not have heard her name, but she's written um, three books. Um, a Deacon's Heart, The United Methodist Deacon, and Advancing the Mission are three books that um, Margaret Ann has written. And when she retired in 2011 is when I came. So um, Garrett has always had that commitment. And what at least I hear, unless that's changed, is I hear from students that um, Garrett is a place where you really can um, discern and question which order you're called to if you're not certain and that you're not going to be um, talked into or badgered or whatever, that one order is better than the other. And we have a lot of students who come to Deacon events, like we have Deacon lunches, um, throughout the year, we have different gatherings, and those orders are uh, those meetings are always open to folks who are sure they want to be a deacon, folks who think they might want to be a deacon, or folks who want to learn more about um, the ministry of deacon. Because even if you're called to be an elder in the United Methodist Church, you need to know what deacons do and their understand their call because you may be the pastor of a church and be talking to someone who's discerning a call to deacon. Um, I have to tell you that when back when I was doing diaconal ministry and I talked to my district superintendent, she had never heard of deacons. And, but I will give her the benefit when we had my charge conference to approve me, she had read everything she could get her hands on. So, um, one of the real advantages, I think, of schools like Garrett is that um, deacons and elders are in classrooms together with each other and are able to learn from each other, and there's this mutual respect at Garrett. So I'll stop there, Grant. I love that. It's, it's so true. I think having the, the unique and diverse perspectives from students and faculty is, is one of the most amazing things about when I was a student, uh, being able to discern that call. Um, so thank you. And and this event, the the very title of this event, the call the Deacon in the Future of the United Methodist Ministry, kind of harkens the the amount of work and support that Garrett is providing to deacons, but also um, the fact that there is the larger uh, denomination. And we know that this is kind of a disorienting time in the church uh, because of the division in the United Methodist Church, but also because generally in all churches, the, the way vocational ministry is really changing. So just uh, for you, do you think it's fair to say that deacons may be the leaders uh, leading us into the future of Methodist ministry? And how do you think deacons have shown us what ministry may look like for the future of the church? Yes, I do think that um, deacons are uh, the future. Um, and I've been trying to think about how to do this in a, a um, succinct way. So whether I, I'm able to accomplish that or not, you can see, you'll be able to see. But um, I, I don't have a, a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. But I, I just want to share a few things I've been thinking about. Um, first, I want to say... 
Um, I want to read a, a comment. I was looking back at Margaret Ann's book, Advancing the Mission, and in it, she has a quote from the what was going to be the ministry study to the to the 2020 uh, general conference, which we still haven't had yet. But there was a study on ministry, which we do every four years. But this particular ministry study said, quote, Deacons help the church love the world with the compassionate heart of Jesus and confront the powers of the world. And I, I really liked that the study committee was able to recognize that um, about deacons. Um, um, part of the language is also that deacons, um, well, deacons are called to word service, compassion, and justice. And compassion and justice um, are often, um, those are the words that are unique to the order of deacon. Word and service are in all three of, um, orders, elder, deacon, and then um, local pastor as far as orders. And um, my language is that um, deacons help um, persons live out their baptismal vows. Um, and I'm going to take a chance of using this metaphor that has meant something to me. Now, I have to say that all metaphors, you have to be careful not to push them too far. Um, and I'm going to give the real condensed version of this. If you want the, the longer version, let me know and I can tell you the background. But I was at a deacon event probably 15 or 20 years ago where it was said um, it, the, the metaphor was deacons are like St. Bernard's. And the reason was it went back showing or talking about how um, in Switzerland, there was this order of um, hospice care and that um, it was their dangerous pathways and people would get caught in the snow and the avalanches. St. Bernard's were the front line of defense when someone may have been caught out in the, the snow or whatever. But here's the thing, the St. Bernard did not um, rescue the person. The St. Bernard went back to the hospice to marshal the resources of the community. And so that um, understanding that deacons are not the ones who serve on behalf of the church. Deacons are the persons who help um, folks in congregations live out their baptismal vows and to marshal the resources of the community for connecting the church and the world. And I wanted to, um, there was another, I think this was in um, what Margaret Ann had, that touched me um, recently that says deacons surprise and challenge the church to see the places that need healing, feeding, or restoration of justice. And so I have to, I have to do this, but it was on my mind this morning during my, um, well, it's been on my mind for the last couple of days during my morning prayer and my evening prayer, um, because for the last couple of days, my morning prayer and evening prayer have been laments um, for children. That is the primary work that I'm doing these days is child advocacy and or um, child thriving. And so it's been on my mind and I wanted to, um, I wanted to share one of the ways that how I think deacons are the future and I'm hoping I can make this connect. Um, I'm making it in my mind. If it's not coming through, you can ask me questions. But I was thinking back as a, for the last 23 years, I've been serving in theological education, which means I'm appointed to the school where I teach, but I have a secondary appointment in a local congregation. Um, I it was a congregation in Memphis, and then there's a congregation here in Evanston. And my, um, connection with those churches has primarily been that I've been asked to teach in those congregations in a variety, teach a variety of things. And I don't know why it came to my mind this morning, but it did. When I was in Memphis um, during Lent, I led a, a session on spiritual practices. And one of the spiritual practices we talked about was the labyrinth. 
because the labyrinth is important to me because it's a way to, to um, walk, to do something, a bodily prayer. And so I led this six week um, during Lent workshop on the labyrinth where we had eight or 10 persons. And at one point during the, the conversation one week, someone in the group said to me, you know, I almost didn't join this group because everything I'd ever heard about labyrinths were that they were um, pagan or were of the occult or they were, you know, she just had uh, what she had heard she was saying. And I said, well, with that in mind, how did, why did you sign up for the, the class? And she said, because I knew you, I'd been in your classes, I trusted you. And so what I was thinking about today, one of the things that deacons often do, whether they are serving in a church or whether they're connected as a secondary appointment, was in Memphis, I was in that congregation 11 year, 12 years. In this congregation in Evanston, I've been here 11 years. So that being able to connect the church and the world um, comes out of helping persons live out their baptismal vows often comes out of um, long-term relationships where you're able to build that trust and collaboration. Um, I've been reading a lot about innovation recently. And one of the, this just stuck in my mind that often we're trying to lead for innovation like we lead for um, change and they're different because leading for change involves a vision, and that's good if, if you have the vision. But when you're in a new place and you don't know what it's gonna look like, you lead for innovation through collaboration. And I think deacons are in a position to collaborate with those in nonprofits and local communities, like um, Dr. Blunt and I have been involved with the Garrett Evanston Freedom School Program, which has been um, an involvement with Garrett and the community, the city of Evanston community schools. So that kind of collaboration leads to innovation that um, works best with um, ways that you're going to be somewhere for a while. Let me end this section and then I'll, I'll stop. But with that in mind this morning, I was, I was thinking about how are we going to um, how do we work with persons so that children can thrive? And I was reminded of one of the um, places I go every summer is the Proctor Institute for Child Advocacy Ministry. And they are one of the, the roles that I've had as a faculty um, person for our Freedom Seminary there is to help persons um, understand the Langston Hughes Library. And one of the ways you understand the Langston Hughes Library there is to understand Langston Hughes. And I don't have time to do it all, but I shared a couple of years ago, two of Langston Hughes's poems and um, go look them up for yourselves later. One is called Kids Who Die and it was written in the 1930s and it could have been written yesterday. And then another poem, and you may see it over my shoulder, when I was doing the last two years with pandemic teaching and meetings, I often heard people say, or people would say, Virginia, why do you have evil over your shoulder? And I didn't realize that that's all people could see. Well, what it is, and I wanna make sure I've, I've, well, I have it here somewhere. I wanna to read to you that Langston Hughes poem. The poem says, it's, it's named Evil. Looks like what drives me crazy don't have no effect on you, but I'm gonna keep on at it till it drives you crazy too. And that's been my mantra for child advocacy and child thriving, that it's a persistent conversation, persistent collaboration, 
police, um, persistent involvement with um, other groups of people. And so that's one of the ways that I think um, deacons are the future of the church and the future of um, child thriving and, and other, um, what I want to say, Dr. Blunt had something on Facebook yesterday, and we've used it in the, the Christian ed department, talking about um, the Masa people, the way they greet folks is to say, how are the children? Because they know if the children are not well, the culture and community is not well. And um, right now, that's where we are. The children are not well, so there's lots for us to do. Okay, Grant, I'll stop because I could go on and on about the thriving of children. Amen. Uh, I'm here for it. I'm so thankful for the words that you've shared. And, and the, I think it's very clear that everything that you are doing in, in your work and in your classroom is so contextual uh, and relevant uh, to what is happening today, what is happening to our children. Um, so I'd be curious if you'd be up for sharing a bit about how some of your courses work at Garrett. What are, what are some of the courses you teach and how, how are potential deacons or anyone taking those courses likely to encounter your work in the classroom and beyond? Okay. When I wrote these down to make sure that I would remember them, uh, let me ask, see if you, see if you um, detect a theme as I read these five. This year I'm teaching, um, this fall I'm teaching history and theories of religious education, um, child advocacy. In January, I'm teaching a course called Educating Christians for Social Change. In May, I'm teaching a book called Children's Books for Liberative Education. And in the summer, I'm doing the Proctor Institute for Child Advocacy Ministry. Um, so yes, do, do you detect a theme? Um, it, so part of all of those courses go towards several things. One is that we have a, a track in child advocacy in the public ministry degree. You can do a child advocacy concentration in the um, Master of Arts in um, Faith, Culture, and Educational Leadership, or you can do a child advocacy concentration in the MDiv. So it, a child advocacy work cuts across the different degrees. We also, we uh, have stopped for the pandemic the last three years, but um, we will, it will be up again next year, I'm, I'm sure, um, is this work with the Garrett Evanston Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools Program, which again is that collaborative work between Garrett and the community using asset-based community development, meaning we look at the strengths of the community and how the community, um, and listening to the community of the needs and the, the assets. Um, but it's also a place where students are able to do field ed assignments, could work at Freedom School, um, other ways to be involved in the Freedom School um, movement. So yes, very contextual, but our classes are um, also, um, I'm trying to think how you asked the question. The, the new degree and the, the language of liberative education is that those of us in the, the religious education field do liberative education, which means it's collaborative, participatory, um, reflective, reciprocal. Um, so all of those are involved. And I think, I think the pedagogy, the con context of where we are, um, deacon, for me, all of that um, seems to be part of a, a tapestry of a whole. Absolutely. I love that. Um, and I put the link to the, the degree program that you were talking about in the chat in case folks okay. want to check it out. Okay. Um, so kind of as a final question here, um, 
we have gotten to hear um, the amazing work that you're doing and uh, some of the collaborative work at Garrett, uh, but just would love to know, you know, deacons end up practicing ministry in a variety of different uh, settings and contexts. Are there any current or former deacon students uh, you can think of who are, are doing innovative ministry in the world that you'd be willing to share? Yes, I'll, I'll just name what they're doing. Um, we have a, a deacon who is um, doing online workshops for helping parents um, be anti-racist parents and working with um, doing book lists for anti-racism and doing books for um, diverse books for children. Um, she had done work with um, um, economic justice work before, but is doing this work now. <laughs> we have a student who is um, creating her own justice-centered worship arts ministry related to creation care. Um, someone who is um, working to be uh, toward becoming a doula, a birth doula. Um, and I say birth doula because there are now, there are death doulas, doulas persons who are able to help kind of hosp um, uh, as an um, um, connecting with hospice, not necessarily through hospice, but again, someone to walk with you. Um, persons doing prison abolition work through the McCormick Solidarity Building Initiative. Um, persons doing a person doing asset-based community de development through the neighboring movement in Kansas. Um, someone who's director of clinical and social health integration and deacon of health partnerships at a health care system. Um, deacon doing public policy and advocacy work. So those are just some of those. And thank you to um, Katie Chambers for helping me think about um, uh, some of the variety of um, innovative and new things that um, folks are doing. And, and that's where um, I think the future is innovation. It's where are you deacons who are feeling that nudge from God, who are feeling called to a particular ministry, um, and then where there's a justice need, a compassion and justice need, are then able to create those opportunities and then help make that bridge with churches. So let me stop there and see if there are questions. And I will say that I think Katie Chambers is on the, um, the, the Zoom meeting and Katie works in, in vocational ministry, works very closely um, with me with Deacon Studies and um, along with um, Grant and um, our, um, I don't know what his actual title is, but in uh, Registrar um, Vince, um, all, we have, at least I know four deacons who are on um, staff faculty at Garrett. So there's lots of um, coordination. Thanks so much, Dr. Lee. It's, it's just so wonderful to hear all of the uh, wonderful, important and diverse spaces that uh, are our deacon colleagues and um, alumni are showing up. And yeah, now this time we'd love to open it up for a time of Q and A. Uh, Katie and Scott, I'm not sure if there have been folks who put things into the chat. Uh, so I'll kind of open it up uh, there as well. Hi all, I am. I have not caught um, a question for Dr. Lee in the chat. So if you have a question about uh, the call of the deacon, the order of the deacon, anything Dr. Lee has shared, um, this would be a time to, to ask your question. And maybe I'll try to put mine on the gallery view so I can see if anyone raises their hand. <clears throat> Um, one question, Dr. Lee, in terms of the, the program in the chat, and then Daniel, I'll come to you, um, has to do with uh, the program that you direct. It says, how long are the intensives for the MAPSL program for the online students? For the online students? 
I, yes, I believe. Okay. Um, well, for for math cell students, there are um, regular semester courses that will be, um, what are we calling those, high flex, that will be students in the classroom and then students who are online. Then there'll also be the intensives. And those that are in January and May will be either one week or two week. It will depend probably, um, I don't know that they've been set, but they'll, it will be either one week or two weeks. All right. Oh, sorry. And just to follow up, I'm not forgetting about you, Daniel, just to make sure we don't get off topic there <laughs> real quick. Uh -huh. um, just how often do online students have to be on campus? And I can probably just jump in quickly on that one to say that there will be intensive sessions both in January and in the summer, in the first section of the summer. Um, but in some ways, you have some flexibility on on some online students will come every single time there's an intensive to participate in those courses. Some will choose not to, of course. Um, and then of course you wanna kind of refer to denominational requirements through your annual conference and through the Book of Discipline as well in terms of making sure you're in line on that end of things. But in terms of, from Garrett's perspective, there'll be two consistent um, in-person options. And then, um, you know, especially if there are electives outside of your specific degree program, you'll have flexibility in terms of what you register for. Um, yeah, and I, and I would say, Scott, I, I'm glad to talk with anyone about that. Um, even though we're a connectional church, every annual conference has different guidelines. And I know um, Virginia has guidelines about um, whether if it's online, then whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, and it has all of these, it's a very complicated thing. So I'm needing to talk with them, but we will at least, I think in the CE field, we are doing um, all of our classes that are in person during the semester will have the um, ability for, for students to do the online part if they're away. Um, and then we will have um, the intensives and we'll probably have January, May, because the math cell has an intensive for students to come for assessment um, and looking at the portfolio. And we're gonna put those two together. So probably the May intensive will be one week or we'll connect it and have two weeks and have the, the assessment part in the middle, trying to do those together. And then there'll be a summer session as well. So there'll actually be three opportunities in that degree to do the um, intensive part. But I'm, um, I don't know all annual conferences, but I do have connections in a lot of places and I do understand um, a lot of the, the language and terminology. So if I can help um, individually, I'm glad to do that as well. Well, and I know at the very least, the Garrett staff and faculty on this call, we've got Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Idaho, Northern Illinois, Virginia, Michigan, Arkansas. So we can hopefully between the group <laughs> of us <laughs> network enough to find out some information depending on where you're coming from. Daniel, why don't you jump in with your question? I'm sorry, actually, I was just, I was just putting it in the chat. Um, one of the common questions that I get as a candidate for ordination to the order of deacon is, and this will uh, probably not surprise um, any of you and, uh, and maybe bring a smile to your face uh, in a knowing way, I suppose. Uh, why do you need to be ordained to do that? So there's a diversity of calls and a lot of different things that deacons can do to serve the church. Um, and uh, many of them don't involve uh, the sacraments necessarily uh, they could but they don't have to and and so I do get asked a lot to uh, really um, articulate I'll say why ordination is important uh, ordination to the order of deacon is important to fulfill a ministry that may be an extension ministry and not serving directly within the local church what, what are your thoughts on that I have lots of thoughts on that and um and Katie and Grant may want to as well, but, um, and I would recommend um, Margaret Ann Crane's new book, Advancing the Mission um, as well. Um, and uh, her succinct answer, which has been my answer as well for a long time is, um, it's not, 
um, why do you need to? It's the church needs you, your call, um, your way of connecting. What, what was my language about um, deacons um, bring compassion and justice to those places that God is leading them to or that um, um, deacons help the church love the um, world with the compassionate heart of Jesus. Deacons have been called, I, I believe strongly, those nudges, those calls from God, that call from God to that specific place in the world is God calling you to help connect that need or connect the church to that need. And so it's trying to help boards of ordained ministry understand it's not about um, your, your rights or your, um, you know, needs. It's what, uh, what are the needs of the church that God is calling you to do? And you can follow up and ask if, I don't know, you know that as, as well, Daniel, but it just, part of it, it becomes um, an education process with boards of ordained ministry because some are better than others at knowing what the ministry of the deacon is. Does that help at all or? <laughs> well, and I may just say- Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, yes, ab absolutely it does. And um, uh, yeah, it, it, that's, that's very helpful and, and I think, um, that uh, I had not realized that um, Dr. Crane's book was already out, and it looks like I missed it by a, by a whole year. So I've just uh, I've just ordered that, and I'll certainly look forward to reading it. I enjoyed the uh, the first of of her books, and it also addressed that uh, topic a little bit. And Scott, no, all I was going to say in passing was uh, you mentioned Katie Chambers, who's on this call, um, who does some amazing work doing mock interviews with folks who are pursuing ordination and who need kind of a run through of what they can expect. And this question has come up in that space. And I often find myself thinking, if we're going to ask that question of deacons, why are we not asking that question of elders as well? You know, that it's not that it's necessarily an inherently bad question, but it is an inherently bad question if we're only directing it at one of the orders. So anyways, soapbox over. <laughs> Um, we are in our last couple minutes here. Um, we'll just share a couple details before we finish up, but is there any final question we want to get out there? Um, if not, oh, do I see a hand? Oh, Warren, yep. <laughs> uh, Dr. Lee, would you mind possibly like sharing your email if we have like specific questions about that program um, or if there was another contact person just um, as we're continuing the discernment process. Uh, thank you. I was going to do that and you reminded me. Um, yes, please. my email is virginia.lee at garrett.edu. Um, and I'm glad to, to be in touch with you. Um, if you write to me, you'll know, you'll get a sabbatical. I'm away from my um, desk notice. Um, since I am on sabbatical, but I'm very glad to make connections with you. Um, there'll be weeks like when I'm at the Proctor Institute that I may not respond right away, but I'm, I would love to be in touch and um, help. I'm, and I'm glad to you get in touch and, and we email, we can set up a Zoom conversation or phone conversation or whatever. Glad for that. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Were there any other questions? Did um, is Ann still on the call? Did Ann have a question that I missed somewhere? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm here. Um, my question was uh, pretty much the question that Daniel put forth. Um, I uh, really uh, liked the response. Like the question isn't why do I need to be ordained, but why does the church need me? Um, I I guess. Um, like along that same line, my question was, um, like, I, I know that deacons do a lot of work in the church and outside, the, uh, as the church dispersed, they do a lot of work, um, and they are helping 
Christians live out their baptismal vows, like I wanted to know like what the difference was between like knowing you're being called to be a deacon in the church dispersed versus like with a primary appointment outside like the local church versus a Christian living out their baptismal vows also in the church dispersed. That's that's like what I'm trying to figure out right now. Right. That one of the um again, Margaret Ann does a really good job. I, I think she did it in the in the yellow and red book, the, the United Methodist Deacons. Yes, that one. But she also in the new one, Advancing the Mission, talking about um that our that understanding our call to deacon is not about function. It's not exactly about what we do. It's about identity um, and that identity of our call. And so that might, um, recognizing that, you know, deacons can, deacons can do, um, I've said many times, I could pastor a church really well but that's not what I'm called to do. I've been clear about um, the, the teaching component. Um, and so here, this might be a good example. Um, being able to articulate things like for an elder, the call to word often means a call to preach. But for deacons, a call to, to word may mean how does, and welcome back. And how does, um, how does one embody and enflesh the word in the actions in the community? Um, now there again, there, there's, that's why it's really hard to do the function part because we could, there is crossover between the elder and deacon, but it comes back to um, what are you being called to do Margaret Ann in um, a deacon's heart calls it that. It's that's understanding your deacon's heart, which again, that's not very, um, that's more subjective than objective. But again, how do you, um, and I think that's what boards of ordained ministry are trying to get at. They haven't gotten the right language yet. How are, can you articulate your identity as a deacon? Um, and we'll, uh, we'll help do that here. I think the, the being in classes with students, um, sometimes I am better at articulating um, my call when I start trying to explain something to someone who's different from me and they start asking me questions. And in that conversation, I become clearer um, so we, we will help do that. That's part of what our lunch is, um, where we bring in deacons from the community um, that we try to help do. I can't promise anything, but I think we do. I think we help with that. Yeah, and I'll just add that um, that what I, as someone who recently went through the boom process, uh, this is the question I uh, also got pushed on. And um, Reverend Katie Chambers uh, setting up mock interviews really helped me think through that and kind of two pieces that were helpful thinking, yes, I am called, this is a calling from God. Boom is like, but how is it different? Um, and I think two places was thinking about um, the, the authority of the church that comes with ordination. Are you called to show up in these spaces with the backing and the support of, of the church? Um, and and also along with that, the kind of prophetic tradition of the deacon's order of, of calling the church to something new, to something better. Um, it is vital that the church has that as a part of its institution because institutions are humans and institutions are gonna make mistakes. And so it's important for us to be a part of that in an ordained uh, capacity uh, moving forward. And so it's just a matter of, is that, uh, where you're feeling called as well. So thanks, Katie Chambers. I just want to say one that probably in those last couple answers from Dr. Lee and from Reverend Grant, you may have gotten a really good snapshot of a potential answer to a board of ordained ministry question. So just saying this is recorded. And if you want to kind of save that in the files somewhere, it may come in handy. Um, but again, just Dr. Lee, thank you so much. I, if we can all give snaps or jazz hands or whatever um, to Dr. Lee and to Grant and to Katie and to our other Katie, 
um, for all being here in different ways um, and just for the work that you all do to support not just our Methodist students, but deacons in particular. Um, Dr. Lee, any final words before I, I give one final announcement? No, but thank you for um, asking me to come today and I really enjoyed having the conversation and I look forward to hearing from some of you. Great, thanks so much. Um, just a couple things. So we are entering the summer period here in our office. That does not mean that things slow down, even though generally things get a little bit, we take deeper breaths as we enter the summer. So we will probably have some other virtual events like this over the next couple months. They're not on the schedule yet because many of us are going to be on the road at annual conferences. So we're going to kind of get through that run. Um, but once we get back, definitely be checking in on our social media and on our website to see what other kinds of conversations like this we are facilitating. And if you are going to be at your annual conference, um, either reach out to us or just keep your eye out to see if we've got a table set up there. It could be one of us on this call. It could be someone else from Garrett who you may not know, but um, they would love to talk to you about any of your questions or at least put you in conversation with us. The last thing I want to say is, um, you know, we've got a deadline coming up uh, in terms of our, our domestic student deadline for the fall 2022. So this coming fall is August 1st. One thing I just want to name about deadlines is that those get decided, right, by some of our, our higher up administration here at Garrett. And it is really not to exclude anyone who was really set on being able to start this fall semester. It is more because we figure out what the date is where we can support you best, both in your kind of on-ramp into coursework and once you arrive on campus, that there are important steps that have to happen uh, before you're able to enter the classroom. For our international students, sadly, a lot of, there's, there's a significantly larger amount of steps that kind of expand beyond what happens within the Garrett community here in terms of visa status, in terms of I-20 paperwork, some of those kinds of things. So you'll see on our website, our international deadline is a little bit earlier, and I know there were some questions about that. And for anyone who's disappointed that they either have already missed a deadline or may not be able to make this August 1st one, just know that there are other points of entry. Um, there's other academic years. There's also other semesters that we can talk about uh, transitioning your application to. Um, and we'll work with you to make sure it's a really smooth um, transition. But the goal is that you are well supported and well prepared to enter coursework. And you don't feel like you're flying in last minute or, or you come in after things have gotten started. So please know that's the spirit of those deadlines. And if you have questions, I would just encourage you to email me directly. Um, Grant, if you can put my email in the chat, um, scott.oslin at gary.edu. I can give, give some broader background on how some of those decisions have been made. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We'll let you know when there's a recording of this that's been edited and ready to go, and hopefully we'll talk to you soon.